All right, as you're being seated, go ahead and take your copy of God's Word. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We continue through the text of verses 14 through 21. As you're turning to find that passage of Scripture, uh, just want to say what a joy it was to be with your men. Uh, it rained all day long except for about three minutes. Uh, we had a little three-minute respite uh, from rain, and then it started up again, but it did, it did not dissuade us at all. Uh, just God was so faithful as he always is, and he blessed in such a powerful way. Uh, what we're looking at here is a prayer. It's actually the second prayer uh, in this letter uh, to the Ephesians. The first prayer I want to remind you, if you want to go there, is Ephesians chapter 1. I'm sure Jason preached through this and did a fantastic job. Ephesians chapter 1, 17 through 18. I want you to see this because this being the second prayer, we want to focus a little bit on that first prayer because the first prayer is all about enlightenment. He says, I want you to know who Jesus is. Listen to how he says this. I'm just going to read 17 and 18. I'm praying that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Look at this. In the knowledge of him. I want you to know Jesus. I'm praying that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, there's that word, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints. So his first prayer is about enlightenment, that you would know Jesus. This second prayer that we're about to to read in just a moment is about enablement, the doing of what you already know. Now that's important. Matter of fact, we know that Brother James tells us, do not just be a hearer of the Word of God, but what? Be a doer of the Word of God. Matter of fact, uh, when I thought about that, uh, as I was studying this last week, that uh, back in the old days, I did youth ministry for many, many years, and there was a, a conference speaker, his name was Dawson McAllister. Does anybody ever remember Dawson McAllister? We would go to these conferences, and we went to one in Dallas, and uh, we were at First Baptist Dallas, and I remember that Dawson said, he, he said, hey, before I get started, I know we have different denominations there, are here, so uh, uh, where are my Methodists out in the audience? And they raised their hand and clapped a little bit. Where are my Pentecostals? Where are my Presbyterians? And there was a few Presbyterians there, all right, packed out and mostly Baptists, because he goes, now where are my Southern Baptists? And you know Southern Baptists, okay? I mean, we hooped and we hollered and we waved and we kind of stuck our chest out like we're all that in a bag of chips. And uh, so he, uh, he said, you know what, man, I love my Southern Baptist. He said, matter of fact, many of you are actually using curriculum probably that Southern Baptist wrote. He said, they're like a machine, man. They've got the Sunday school board and they put out all this curriculum. He said, but I have one thing against my, my Southern Baptist brethren today. He said, they know more than they do. I've never forgotten that. He said, I've got, I've got one thing against Southern Baptists. Man, they've got this great machine. They put out all this curriculum. It's unbelievable. But they know more than they do. And so in this second prayer, he's saying, listen, it's about enablement. And what we're gonna see at the end is it's not you doing the work. Listen, it's God able to do the work through you. That's the truth we've gotta lock into this morning. Now, there are three parts to this prayer, the invocation, the petition, and the benediction, and we'll walk all three. But let me read it and then say a word of prayer. For this reason, verse 14, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We need to hear from you today. Uh, There's no one here, including me, that needs to hear my words. But uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to hear you speak to our heart in a deep way. Again, as I think about this, that we would not just say yes and amen this truth, but we would live it out for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, let's look at the invocation, verses 14 uh, and 15. Look what he says. He says, I bow my knees 
before the Father. Now, I, when you look through Scripture, and Jason knows what I'm talking about, there's a lot left on the cutting room floor when you, floor when you prepare a sermon. I mean, we could go about two hours in all. There's so many nuggets of truth here. But we don't want to skip over when he says, I bow my knee. God's been teaching me, even as I've studied that this week, that there's something about taking a knee and bowing before the Father. And I don't want because what he is saying with that statement of I bow my knee is posture matters. Posture matters because when you go low, what you're saying is in humility, Heavenly Father, I submit to you. And in humility, I recognize you're God and I'm not. You're God and I'm not God. And I desperately need you. So in humility and submission, I bow before you. And what he's saying is I'm ready to listen and obey. Even in Matthew 26, it says, 26, it says this, that Jesus, the Son of God, fell on his face before the Father. So one thing I might challenge you this morning is just, I don't know if your posture is you pray to God in the recliner, maybe, or laying flat of your back on the bed at night, you pray a little bit, and then maybe you go to sleep and say amen in the morning, because you, you know, that kind of thing. But maybe, just maybe, what God is teaching me, maybe he'll speak to you, is maybe I need to pay attention to posture because I want God to know I'm ready to listen and obey. Now look what he says next. From whom every family derives its name. Now I like the King James Version here. I don't use that often, but it says the whole family, not every family, because if you read this, and, and let's look at it, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I'm reading out of the New American Standard. It sounds like almost universalism, that I'm praying this message is for every family on the face of the earth. But what we know, the reason the King James is better, is the whole family speaks to the family of God. He says, I am praying this prayer, not just for the church at Ephesus, I'm praying it for First Baptist Bernie. I'm praying this prayer for the whole family of God. Now let me take a moment to share this. I want you to hear this truth very carefully. Not everyone here is a child of God, perhaps. I don't know that. I'm not the Holy Spirit. But not every person on the face of the planet is a child of God. I want you to listen to me. Because of create, in crea God of creation, every person is an image bearer of God. Absolutely. Every person bears the image of God. But not every person is a child of God. I'll prove it to you. If you go to John chapter one, okay? Matter of fact, it's, it's John chapter one, verse 12, and here's what it says. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believed in his name. And if you go back to Ephesians chapter two, verse three, it says, by nature, we're children of wrath. We're not children of God. We're born children of wrath. The only way you become a child of God, and let me kind of paraphrase John 1, 12 in the way that I like to say it. Listen carefully. To all who believe and all who receive, he gives them right to become children of God. There are two parts to that. Not only do you have to believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins, that three days later he came out of the tomb conquering sin and death. He's now ascended in glory to the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and me. Not only do you believe all that, that he is uh, your savior and your Lord, but he's only your savior and your, your Lord. When you do that second thing, you receive him. Listen, the enemy believes the Bible is true. Right. Satan believes in the inerrancy of this book, the scripture the holy word of God. He believes it's all true. He believes that Jesus left heaven, came to this earth, lived perfectly for 33 years, died on the cross for the sins of the world, three days later came out of the tomb, conquering sin and death, now is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. He believes all that. What he's never done is taken a knee. But one day he will, because the scripture says one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But understand this, I'm not the Holy Spirit, I don't know your heart, I don't know, but I can tell you this, not, you know, a, a disaster sweeps through a town and, and the mayor gets up and they're, they're doing a press conference and maybe the chief of police and somebody says, I'm watching the TV, and they say, well, send out some good thoughts and maybe some prayers because after all, we're all children of God. And I don't yell at the TV, but I calmly go, no, we're not. It sounds good, 
We're all image bearers of God, but you're a, you're a child of God when you take a knee. You're a child of God when you not only believe the truth of who Jesus is and what he's come to do, but you receive him. All who call on the name of the Lord, that's receiving him, shall be saved. And we don't want to miss this. Now, that's the invocation. That's a sermon in and of itself, but we're going to keep on going. The petition is in 16 through 19, and it's like a nautical telescope. You've seen those movies where the captain stands out there on the bridge and he takes that telescope and he goes like this. There are four parts to this petition and one leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. And here are the four parts. Strength, depth, comprehension, and fullness. Those are the four parts. Let's look at the first one. Strength. Look at verse 16. I pray that you'll be strengthened with power through his spirit. Now, if he's praying, he's not praying that you'll have the spirit. He's saying, hey, the whole family of God, you have the spirit, but maybe you're not strong in the spirit. So what he's really saying here is the Holy Spirit, listen, is present in all Christians, but only powerful in some. Don't miss that. The Holy Spirit is present in all Christians, but only powerful in some. Uh, years ago, I heard this statement, and here's what a person said. He said, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, at that moment, you have all the Holy Spirit you'll ever need. The rest of your life, here's the question, does he have all of you? Amen. You have all the Holy Spirit you'll ever need. Here's the question. Does he have all of you? And so the question is, how can the power of the Holy Spirit become powerful in me? Now, we don't want to miss this. Holy Spirit's present in all Christians but only powerful in some. Well, how does that happen? Look at this. According to the riches of his glory. Now, when you see the phrase there of his glory, he's talking about Jesus returning back to gl the glory with the Father, where he's at the right hand of the Father. He returns back to glory. Now, in the, in the uh, upper room, he told his disciples before he was gonna die that I'm gonna have to leave you. But he said, it's really better that I go away because I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit, the comforter to be with you, to walk alongside you. And I'm, when I return to glory, I will send the Holy Spirit so that I will now be with you 24 seven. I'll be with you all the time. So according to the riches of his glory, he sends the Holy Spirit, look at this, to the inner man, to the inner man. Here's what I want you to see. If we were to go to Luke chapter four, we would see the baptism of Jesus. I don't, don't miss this. Because you're like me, man, how can I live the Christian life? I mean, Jesus lived it perfectly, but after all, he was God. But what we know is he was fully God and fully man. And if you go to Philippians chapter two, it says that he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And what that means is he never stopped being God, but listen, but he stopped using being God. It's a big difference. Never stopped being God, but he stopped using being God. Listen, Jesus had to be able to sin to be the perfect sacrifice, right? So he lived as fully God, but also as fully man. So at the baptism of Jesus, when he comes out of the water, John the Baptist baptizes him, two things happen. And you know what those two things are. First of all, the word of God from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's the first thing. The second thing is what? The Holy Spirit like a dove descends on him. So from that moment on, he shows us how to live the Christian life. The same way he lived his ministry perfectly. The two things he used to live a sinless life are the same two things you have. So you can't use that, you and I, we can't use that excuse anymore. Well, it's easy for Jesus, he's God. No, he laid that down in that he didn't use being God. He never stopped being God, but he didn't use it. He used the two things that are available to you and me. The word of God and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word of God and the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, immediately he comes out of the water, you know what it says? He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, right? So he's led by the Spirit, he shows us that. Then when he's tempted, when he, when he answers the accuser, what does he use? Uses the word of God. So he shows us in his baptism, it's symbolic of and right after his baptism, that he used the word of God, he listened to his father, I only do what my father tells me to do, that's what the scripture says. And then the Holy Spirit leads him, guides him, directs him. Listen, do you have those same two things available to you? Absolutely, the word of God 
and the strength of the Spirit in the inner man. Now, we've got to move on. He said, I pray you'll have the strength of the Spirit so that you can go deep. The second part of that telescope, if you will, is depth in verse 17. Look what it says. So that you may, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. He says, I want the love of God to dwell in you, that you'll be rooted in his love and grounded in his love. Now, that word dwell, he uses really three pictures to describe spiritual depth here. One is the word dwell. Now, he doesn't use the Greek word to dwell as a stranger. See also Abraham as a foreigner. He doesn't use that word for dwell. He uses the word for dwell that, set, that means to settle down and feel at home. He says, I pray that Jesus will dwell with you. That his love will be so real to you that Jesus and his love will settle down and be at home in your life so that his love will control you. What does the scripture say? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You're not your own. You don't own you. Jesus owns you. I pray he'll dwell in you. He'll settle down and feel at home in your life. And then he uses the word rooted. He uses the word rooted. Now a good uh, Old Testament passage to help us see what that's talking about is Jeremiah 17. Look what it says. Jeremiah 17, verses seven and eight. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted. Look at all this imagery. A tree planted by water, sends out its roots by the stream, does not fear, here's the result, will not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green, it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Even in the toughest times of your life, if you're locked in and rooted in the love of God, you will not cease to bear fruit even through the difficult times of life. But what a great promise. What a great promise. So I think as a Christian, we need to ask, where does my nourishment come from? Where are my roots? Do my roots go deep into the love of Jesus Christ. And then look at the third word that he uses. He uses the word grounded. It's an architectural term comparing a, a, the believer to a building established uh, on love is the foundation. And so when love is your foundation, any building needs a strong foundation. And so here's the deal. You can't, you, you can't go high unless you go deep. That's what he's saying here. I want you to be grounded in his love. If, if you'll be grounded in his love, if you'll go deep, then you can go high. So he says, I want the love of God to dwell in you deep down inside you, to be at home with you. And then I want the love of God to be rooted in you so that even during the tough times, the love will come out and the love will show up. And I want the love of God to be grounded in you so that you can, look at the next part of this, of this nautical telescope, so you can comprehend. You can comprehend his love. You can know his love. Now watch this, to know how much Christ loves you. You know what's so important for us today to hear out of this message? To deeply comprehend. One, one commentary said to apprehend, which means this, to grasp his love and to make it your own. To grasp his love and to make it your own, that we need to somehow comprehend the depth of how much Jesus loves us. And I hope and pray we'll do that today. Grasp and make it your own. And he uses these words, the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. Now, it takes a lifetime because the last part of 19 says, it surpasses knowledge. Now, I was reading about John Stott and his commentary on this passage, and he says, the love of God in Christ is broad enough to encompass all mankind, which means he loves everyone. Long enough to last for eternity, his love will never end, amen. Deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner, the worst person you know, the love of God can reach that person. And high enough to exalt the believer to heaven. Now, I want to somehow, I'm thinking, how could I? It says this love surpasses knowledge. That we can't even, on, on our best day, think of how deep and awesome the love of God is. So I thought, how can I possibly illustrate this? And I've come up with an illustration that I will agree is far short because it says it surpasses knowledge, but I'm gonna give it a, I'm gonna give it a shot. Is that okay with you? 
I'm gonna give it a shot. The love of a grandparent to a grandchild. Now follow me here. The reason I say that is because if you are not a grandparent, you have zero idea what I'm talking about. How many grandparents we got? Raise your hand. See, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not a crier. I've cried like two times my whole life, okay? But I can just think of my firstborn grandson, Pascal Luke Dotson, the All-American is what I call him. I named him that at birth. He's nine years old now. I can think about Pascal. I can picture him in my mind and the tears begin to flow. I begin to tear up when I think about Pascal and Dwell, the other three are girls, Dwell and Winslow and Rousseau. Those are my four grandchildren. But I'm gonna give you this illustration to show you what I'm talking about. It's an extravagant, unbelievable love. There's nothing you wouldn't do for your grandchildren. And the family was in one time, we were in, you know, I'm back at Central now, but for 14 years I was pastor in Brownwood, Texas, and, and uh, I would always shop at the Brookshire's there in Brownwood. And so I had Pascal with me. Jamie had sent me to the store to get some paper goods because the family was in. So I had a little three-year-old Pascal with me. I go down the aisle, and I'm looking at the paper good aisle, and I'm getting the paper plates, et cetera. And in, in smaller towns, in stores like that, you're not gonna have paper goods on on the whole aisle, you may have some hardware in one section, you may have some toys in one section. And so I'm, I'm, at, the, I'm at the paper good aisle and, and it's got some of those other sections and I can't find Pascal. Now where's Pascal? I don't wanna lose him. And I go, Pascal, where? And I look over and he's in front of this little section with these little hooks where it's the toy section, okay? And he start, I look at him, he's pulled two toys off the shelf and he's got them in his hand. So I walk up to him and I go, Pascal, what are you doing? He goes, oh, Grambo. He calls me Grambo, they all do. I said, oh, Grambo, can I have one of these? And there were several people around the aisle and they were looking at me and kind of paying attention to this little scene that was unfolding before them. And we were actually very close to this register. And I had my paper goods and I leaned down and I said, son, let me teach you something. You're in what we call Grambo world when you come to Brownwood, Texas. And you can have every toy you can carry to that register. <laughs> I'm not making it up. And he goes, oh, he just gasped. And he starts yanking toys. He puts the cap gun there. You need, and I'm helping him. Man, you need caps to go on that gun. And he's piling, and he's got a pile of those toys. And everybody's laughing. And he's walking over there to the restaurant and they're falling, I'm putting them back up and he's, you know, he can barely even walk. He piles it up on the conveyor belt there and the lady checking us out, she heard it, she's laughing. And he looks at me and he looks down and there's this big giant Rice Krispie treat. And he looks at the Rice Krispie treat and he looks at me. He looks at the Rice Krispie treat and he looks at me and I go, like I said, everything, buddy. And he goes, boom, wham, he adds the Rice Krispie. Does that, I'm done now. And we check out. I mean, the whole thing was, you know, $21.37 or whatever, it wasn't a lot. He didn't know that. He just thought it was, you know, Grambo, you're all the way home. Man, you're awesome, man, you're cool. I just wanted him, and I'm gonna remind him of this, in, in, in some way, the love of God's even more awesome than that. Man, we sang about it. There's nothing God wouldn't do for you. Matter of fact, he sent his only son to die for you. Unbelievable love, extravagant love, love that we cannot really understand. And actually, if you're, here's the point. If you don't have a grandchild, I don't have enough words in the English language to help you understand what's in my heart for my grandkids. It is unbelievable how deep that love is. I can't explain it where you can get it. And that's basically what Paul was saying. I want you to grasp this love and make it your own so that you can love like he loves. Don't miss this. You don't grasp this love of God just to enjoy it, but so you can love this world like God loves this world. And we need to get that because it ends with this. So you'll have the fullness of God. Look in the last part of verse 19. I pray that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now listen to this. That you may be filled up to all the fullness. Here's what it really means. That is in God himself. 
He's not saying, I want you to have much of God and little of self. Don't miss this. He's not saying, I want you to have much of God and little of self. He's saying, I want you to have all of God and none of self. That's what he says. I want you to be filled up with all the fullness that is in God himself. I want you to have all of God and none of self. Now, he wouldn't pray that unless that's possible. Because you look at that and you go, man, how could that be possible? I mean, this side of heaven, can that really happen? He wouldn't pray it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit if that's not possible. So it is possible. And he said, I want you to have the fullness of God. Now, what does that mean? What kind of work does God want to do in you and me? And this is an old illustration. I'm sure you've probably heard it before, but it's so good I got to use it again. I've never been to Florence, Italy. My wife has. She's seen Michelangelo's David, his sculpture of David. And uh, I've always wanted to see it. But the story goes, I don't know if it's true, but it makes a good story, that someone right after he presented that sculpture, somebody walked up and said, so how did you create David out of that block of, I don't know if it's granite or marble, I don't know what it's made of, but how did you take that block and create David? And here's what he said. He said, it's easy. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. Think about that. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. You're gonna look exactly like Jesus when you get to heaven. But between now and when you get to heaven, here's what he, and that last thing I want you to be filled up with all the fullness that is God himself, is he wants his goal is this side of heaven. He wants to chip away everything in you that is, is not Jesus so that what's left over is Jesus. Take away everything that isn't Jesus so that what you really look like. Listen, he says he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, right? Amen. Chip away everything that isn't Jesus. Now here's the benediction very quickly, verses 21, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond what we ask to, or think according to the power that works in us. Now here's, here's the enablement here, don't miss this. To him who is able to do all. You're not able to do all. How do I live out this power and this love through the power of the Holy Spirit? You don't do it. He does that through you. He is able to do it. You're not able to do it. He is able to do all, far above all, beyond all, abundantly beyond all. We ask or think. You can't think of enough or ask enough where you really comprehend what he can do for you. And I can't do that either. And this power works in us. Paul is saying, I already have more than enough love and power to walk in victory. Now, why is this love and power given to us? Look at verse 21. To him be the glory, don't miss this, in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Why is this love and why is this power given to you and me for his glory? Listen, my life verse is 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Perhaps you have a life verse. That's been mine for a long time because I read it years ago and I thought that's what it's all about. That's God's will for my life. It's actually God's will for your life. If you don't have a life verse, this would be a good one to have. And here's what it says. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do for the glory of God. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do for the glory of God. And here's what it means to glorify God. Let me give you this definition. To reveal and reflect who he is and what he's done to this world. That he wants you to give him glory in everything you say and do. And you are to reveal and reflect who he is and what he's done in and through everything you do and everything you say. In other words, it's like a microscope and a telescope because to the world lost without Jesus, God's not very big and God's far away. So a telescope takes something far away and brings it near. A microscope takes something really small and makes it larger. So I wanna be a telescope for God and a microscope for God so that people see a clearer picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done by everything I say and everything I do. Amen. He said, you have this power and love, not just to have it, you have it to use it, and you wanna use it not for your glory, but for his glory. So here's the way it ends. You have all the power and the love and the Holy Spirit you'll ever need. Here's the question. Does he have all? of you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We, uh, we already know we, we cannot really understand 
how much you love us. But we, we do understand this, that you love us in such a deep way that if we'll grasp that love, that we'll love people like you love us. Father, that's what we wanna do because we care about one thing. We must decrease. You must increase. Amen. We want you to receive the glory for it all. In Christ's name I pray, amen.